You know, whenever I hear that phrase, internationally known economist, I'm reminded of um, when I first became an internationally known economist. I was lecturing in Brazil back in the 1950s under the sponsorship of the State Department. The State Department received a request from the Argentinian Chamber of Commerce, which was putting up a new headquarters building, and they said they'd like to have an internationally known American economist come give the dedicatory address for the dedication of this building. The State Department looked around the world for an American economist, and I was the closest one to Buenos Aires, so I became an internationally known economist. <laughs> That experience was interesting, not only with regard to just the chance to visit Buenos Aires and the Argentine, but also those were the waning days of Perón. And following my talk at the Argentinian Chamber of Commerce, I was invited to a dinner given by a group of people who had formerly edited and produced the weekly Economic Digest. And at the dinner that night that I was invited to, there was only mail company and one person waiting the table who occasionally joined in the conversation, which was all in English. And I inquired afterwards about, you know, what was the occasion of this special dinner and how come we had this arrangement, which was unusual for the Argentine. And they said, well, this dinner was in commemoration of and commiseration for the death of the weekly Economic Digest. It had died two years before on the date that we were holding the dinner. It was a paper that evidently Mr. Perone had not favored. And so he had tried to kill it for a number of years and finally had managed to kill it by the fact that the government controlled the allocation of newsprint. And they simply cut off the newsprint allocation for the Economic Digest and it died. So a little loss of freedom just in the government's control of newsprint allocation at the time. But what I want to talk about mainly today is simply the whole complex behavior or the results of politics upon the prosperity of the country as well as on our freedom. Now, politics is sometimes defined as the art of who gets what. Or there's my group of friends at the Center for the Study of Public Choice at George Mason University who describe politics as a game of rent seeking. Now, the appalling thing about politics is that this is a negative sum game. And we're all players in this game, at least as passive victims, whether or not we actually actively participate in the game. See, the consequence of this negative sum game is that as a nation, we end up with less than what is put into the game, and we become less prosperous and less free as a consequence. At least in a game like poker, which is a zero sum activity, what one player loses, another one wins. But in politics, the losses are greater than the winnings. And that's why I call it a negative sum game. Now to illustrate the point that the losses are greater than the winnings, let's just uh, consider the politics of sugar. You know, the owners of land used for growing sugar beets and for growing sugar cane have persuaded Congress to impose quotas and tariffs on sugar imports restricting our freedom to buy from the cheapest source. The result is that we pay 14 cents a pound more for sugar than we would pay if the sugar trade were free of politically imposed impediments. Now these trade restraints cost consumers $2 billion a year as we pay $2 billion more for the sugar we buy than if there were no trade barriers. Now the owners of sugar beet and cane growing land receive $900 million more in rents than they would otherwise receive. And the government collects $400 million in duties and fees. So the landowners and the government together gain $1.3 billion. But that $1.3 billion again comes at the cost to the rest of us of $2 billion. Somehow $700 million disappears. There's a $700 million loss to us all collectively as a consequence of the political power of the sugar lobby. Now what causes that loss, what causes the gains to some of us then to be less than the cost to the rest of us? Well, let me give you some simplified arithmetic to illustrate the balance between the losses and the gains involved. You know, suppose if there were no import restrictions, farmers would devote, let's say, one million acres to sugar and earn a rent of $200 an acre. 
Uh, with import restrictions, the resulting rise in price of sugar causes the rent on that specialized sugar growing land to rise to $1,000 an acre. And so the owners of that 1 million acres then gain $800 million in annual rentals. Now that $800 million that they gain can be regarded as a pure transfer from consumers to owners of sugar land. And since the consumer's loss on that part is exactly offset by the sugar farmer's gain, there's no net loss to us collectively on that part. But with sugar now selling at a higher price and sugar land renting for $1,000 an acre, some land that was more productively employed growing potatoes or wheat is transferred to growing sugar. Now assume that transferred land was productive enough to earn a $900 rent when used to grow wheat. And if, let's say, a million acres is transferred to sugar growing at $1,000 an acre, the owners of that land then gain $100 million annually. But the land was transferred from uses where each acre produced $900 worth of wheat to a use where it produces only $200 worth of sugar per acre. So there's a net loss then of $700 per acre or $700 million worth of product. And that's a loss from which nobody gains, a loss which we economists characterize as a deadweight loss. Actually, the loss is even larger than that resulting from the transfer of land from more productive to less productive uses. Resources are used to lobby for the sugar quotas and the tariffs, resources that could be more productively employed. The owners of cane and sugar land devote some of that extra $900 million they confiscate from the rest of us to hiring lobbyists to persuade Congress to pass the legislation that they desire. And because of that cost, landowners end up with less than something like the extra $900 million in income. So our total output available for consumption and for investment is hurt then not only by the transfer of land to less productive uses, but also by the transfer of resources from production to lobbying and to campaigning for the election of right-minded congressmen and senators. Now, in addition to our domestic deadweight losses, there are also losses to foreign producers. They suffer from the loss of sugar markets, and they're forced to transfer their land from more productive to less productive uses. And those foreign losses frequently become our losses because they result in political instability, and we then find it necessary to extend foreign aid and military assistance as a consequence. Well, since the losses from our sugar policy are greater than our gains, why do we enact such policies? Is it Congress's sadistic intent to make us less prosperous? Well, clearly that's not the reason that politics turns out to be a negative sum game. To find a more rational explanation, we first must realize that the aim of a congressman is to get reelected. His aim is to maximize his electoral prospects, not to maximize the nation's prosperity. And second, we must recognize the fact that voters are rationally ignorant. A sugar policy costs each family about $40 a year. Now to keep up with congressional machinations with respect to sugar, a voter would have to spend a couple hundred dollars worth of time to analyze and understand the issue. It's not worth spending $200 to save $40. And third, while the costs of sugar legislation are spread thinly over a large population, the benefits, however small relative to that cost, are concentrated on only a few. To the sugar grower who receives a $20,000 reward, it's worth spending three or $4,000 to keep himself informed and to contribute to the joint efforts with other sugar producers to sway Congress and the White House. So while everybody may be represented in Congress, there's little influence from the rationally ignorant and strong influence by the few on whom the benefits of government actions are concentrated. Now the sugar program is simply one of a number of politically formulated policies that impoverish us. Policies whose costs are greater than their benefits. You know, another example of such a policy is that forbidding the sale of Alaskan oil to foreign customers. Now that serves to increase transportation costs, reduces the returns to Alaskan oil producers, and decreases the revenues collected by the Alaskan and federal governments from their taxes on oil and on the earnings from the production of oil. Now the few producers of Alaskan oil who suffer these substantial losses are not rationally ignorant. 
So what has kept them from exerting pressure sufficient to repeal the restrictions on the sale of oil? Now, there are two main reasons for their failure. One is that the taxes and royalties collected by the state of Alaska and the windfall profits tax and the corporate earnings taxes imposed by the federal government result in the fact that only 10 percent of any price rise at the wellhead remains with the producers. There's little incentive for producers to spend their political capital then to reduce the nation's transportation costs. Now, the second reason for the restrictions on the freedom of Alaskan oil producers to sell to whoever will pay the highest price have not been, re have not been repealed is that the Seafarers Union supports the restrictions. The maritime unions are strong proponents of confining the sale of Alaska oil to domestic customers. You see, the unions have a lock on the jobs of transporting goods between American ports. The Jones Act does not allow foreign ships to operate between American ports. So by preventing the sale of oil from Alaska to foreigners, the maritime unions monopolize the jobs involved in the transportation of Alaska's oil. So consequently, we use $5 worth of resources to ship crude oil through the Panama Canal to the Gulf and East Coast ports instead of $1 shipping oil to Japan and $1 shipping oil from Japan's present sources to the United States. The extra resources used to ship Alaskan oil to U.S. ports could be more productively employed producing other goods, which would add to our prosperity. The restrictions on the sale of Alaskan oil cost us about $1 billion annually. Now, these policies I've just, annualized, just analyzed redistribute a small amount of income from each of a large number of rationally ignorant customers to produce large benefits for few, each of a few well-informed producers. Essentially, these policies impose a tax on consumers. Now, there's another group of policies which cause large debt weight losses through a direct misallocation of scarce resources to monumental projects whose benefits fall far short of the costs. Consumption of goods from these projects is subsidized to persuade people to use services that are not worth their cost. The Tennessee Tom Bigby project, the canalization of the Arkansas River, the development of a port in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the proposed double locking of the Illinois Waterway, the $12 billion subsidy to date of Amtrak, and that fiasco known as whoops, all use large amounts of resources to produce small benefits. You know, an analysis of the five partially built nuclear plants for the Washington Public Power Supply System, that's the full name of whoops, two of which have already been canceled after the expenditure of nearly $3 billion, with two more on the verge of cancellation, provides a lesson in the losses that result when prices are politically determined. The Bonneville Power Administration sold electricity in the 1970s for less than one half cent per kilowatt hour. Now, the result of Bonneville's price policy was a rapidly growing demand for electricity in the Pacific Northwest. Now, that prompted the Bonneville Power Administration to urge the construction of the now canceled nuclear power projects. Now, the cost of power from Whoops five nuclear plants, if the projects were completed, would exceed seven cents per kilowatt hour. Now, it was not expected that there would be enough demand for electricity at that price to justify the construction of those generating stations. But Bonneville offered to subsidize the nuclear plants by raising its own price for electricity from three-tenths of a cent to two cents, so that electricity from the new nuclear plants could also be sold at two cents. It said, in effect, produce the electricity at a cost of seven cents and give it away for two cents, since there will be little demand for seven-cent electricity. In other words, BPA urged the assignment of resources to constructing a project which would eliminate the output of seven cents worth of other goods for every kilowatt hour produced and instead produce goods worth only two cents. Now, if it costs more than seven cents to produce electricity and the best price it can command on the open market is two cents, we're providing a good worth less to consumers than the products that could be produced instead. The cost of producing any product is the value of the alternative product sacrificed. What WHOOPS would do if completed 
would be to produce about a half a billion dollars worth of electricity annually, but we would sacrifice the production of $2 billion worth of other goods that could be turned out with the resources devoted to whoops. Now that would reduce our national output and our national income by one and a half billion dollars. That's hardly the road to prosperity. Political pricing, whether for electricity, mass transit, or airport capacity, causes an overallocation of capital and other resources to projects which contribute far less to our prosperity than would be contributed if those resources were left free for other uses. And it also means that existing facilities are not efficiently utilized. You know, the inefficient utilization of our public facilities caused by political pricing is exemplified by the pricing of airport services. The demand for runway landing and takeoff capacity at current pricing levels at LaGuardia, O'Hare, Washington's National Airport, and Los Angeles far exceeds the capacity available at those airports. Now, if a uniform landing fee per unit of runway capacity were set at each of these airports at a level which restricted the rate of demand to equality of the available supply, only those flights into these airports which made efficient use of the available capacity would be made. However, the political power of the operators of small planes, generally referred to as general aviation, is such that only a $5 landing fee is charged for single-engine planes at O'Hare, for example, while a 727 has to pay $167. Now, many general aviation flyers choose to land at O'Hare for $5 rather than landing free farther north at Palwaukee, since if they're going to downtown Chicago, landing at O'Hare saves $15 in cab fare and 10 minutes of travel time. But that prevents a commercial flight that may be carrying anywhere from 100 to 300 passengers from obtaining a landing slot. If a minimum landing fee of, let's say, $100 were charged during the busy hours at O'Hare, O'Hare would be more efficiently utilized. Those flights to which it is not worth $100 to land at O'Hare because it's nearly as convenient to use Palwaukee or Midway would be diverted then from O'Hare to these other airports, freeing the runways at O'Hare for commercial flights whose passengers have to connect with other flights. Even a small increase in the minimum landing fees at overburdened airports can markedly improve efficiency. Many of you may remember the pictures that appeared on the front covers of several magazines in the early 70s, which showed dozens of planes waiting in line at LaGuardia an hour or more for takeoff. Large amounts of fuel were burned in the idling engines of those aircraft, and hundreds of passengers wasted thousands of hours every day in those planes waiting to take off and in the planes that were stacked waiting to land. Now, LaGuardia management finally screwed up its nerve to take the political heat from raising the minimum landing fee from $5 to $25 during the busy hours. And guess what happened? Forty percent of general aviation aircraft that had been using LaGuardia began using Teterboro and other less busy airports and the lines waiting for takeoff at LaGuardia and the planes stacked in the air decreased dramatically. You know, even our pollution controls, which potentially could create benefits greater than costs, have been pushed so far that their costs have come to exceed benefits. You know, reducing auto emissions by 90% in the mid-70s did produce annual benefits worth about $10 billion at a cost of about $8 billion, leaving us the net gain. However, we enacted some changes, and pushing on to the 1979 and 1980 standards, added another $5 billion in the cost of auto emission control to produce perhaps an additional billion dollars of benefits. Most of the estimates are short of a billion dollars. That's a generous estimate. So what could have been a net positive return has been turned into a loser. We're spending about $13 billion annually on auto emission controls to produce eight to $9 billion in benefits. The 1977 amendments to the Clean Air Act, which require exceedingly costly scrubbers at all new coal-using electric power plants, regardless of the sulfur content of the coal used, do not have the virtue even of reducing pollution, which at least can be claimed as a benefit for the auto emission controls. 
and 1977 regulations on sulfur emissions at new power plants will actually produce more sulfur oxide emissions than the less costly alternative approach of allowing the use of low sulfur coal in place of high sulfur coal as a means of controlling pollution. We've deliberately replaced the pre-1977 regulations, which were less costly and which resulted in less pollution, with new regulations, which are more costly and which will increase pollution. Now, there is a gain to the owners of land containing high sulfur coal and to the miners of high sulfur coal, but their gain is minuscule compared to the cost of the users of electricity, which will amount to at least $3.4 billion a year by the year 2000. Now, the excuse for the absurd scrubber requirement was to preserve the jobs of miners of high sulfur coal, but the other jobs destroyed will more than offset the number of mining jobs preserved. Now, since we've been getting so-called job-creating bills and more are proposed because of the recent and current high unemployment rates, let me dwell on some of those measures that destroy more jobs than they create, despite the fact that they are labeled as job-creating bills. Maybe we need a truth and labeling law for federal legislation. Now, it may seem paradoxical that job-creating bills destroy more jobs than they create, so let me explain how they work. The highway bill, for example, was touted as creating more than 300,000 jobs. Now, it imposed an additional tax of five cents a gallon on gasoline. It collects $5 billion a year in tax revenues. Those funds are being expended on highway projects and on subsidizing mass transit. Now, assume for the moment that all those funds go into hiring additional workers. Assume that none of the funds go into paying people more who already are employed on highway projects and in mass transit work. Now, that assumption is contrary to fact, but it produces the most favorable outcome. Now, because of government regulations such as the Davis-Bacon Act, which restrict the freedom of contractors to hire willing workers, federal contractors are forced to hire people at amazingly high pay rates. Currently, highway and mass transit workers and the people who produce the supplies and equipment used are paid a little over $30,000 a year. That means that the $5 billion expended from the additional tax on gasoline could hire an additional 167,000 people. Notice, not 300,000, 167,000. But that $5 billion that goes to pay for the, addition, the additional tax is no longer available for buying other goods. And those who would be producing these other goods no longer have jobs or are able to find jobs producing those other goods. Now, since average worker compensation, the production of all goods is approximately $20,000 a year, that means the $5 billion paid as gasoline tax is not used to buy other goods which could be, would be produced by 250,000 people. As you can see, the 250,000 jobs destroyed is greater than the 167,000 jobs created through the highway and transit program. The highway bill then decreases the number of jobs by 83,000, even assuming that all the increased spending goes into hiring additional workers. But that additional spending does not go into hiring additional workers. Some of the money is used for pay raises. In the transit industry, which is receiving an additional subsidy financed by the new gasoline tax, we know that the larger the subsidy received, the higher the pay rates for transit workers. If we look at what's happened to the pay rates of these workers after the government began subsidizing the industry, we see a marked rise in the relative pay rates of transit workers. Before the government began its subsidy program, the average transit worker received approximately the same rate of pay as the average factory worker. As soon as the federal subsidy program began in 1964, the pay rates of transit workers began rising faster than the pay of factory workers. From 1964 to 1980, factory worker pay rates rose by 187 percent. Since the federal subsidy program began, the pay rates of transit workers in that same period rose by 226 percent. And in addition, fringe benefits of transit workers increased faster than those of factory employees. Transit workers are now paid much more than the average factory worker and collect much more in fringe benefits. In Chicago, for example, transit workers are now paid 60 percent more 
than the average Chicago factory worker. The annual compensation of a bus driver in Chicago is now $35,000 a year. The average annual compensation of a full-time Chicago factory worker is approximately $22,000 a year. Increasing subsidies to an industry increases the pay rates of people working in the subsidized industry. So the $5 billion raised by the highway bill doesn't all go into hiring additional workers. Much of it goes into raising the compensation of one group like transit workers. And the pay of highway repair workers is also being increased as a consequence of the highway bill. Congress put a special provision in the bill extending the application of the Davis-Bacon Act to repair work on highways. It didn't used to apply. The Davis-Bacon Act provides the pay rates on government construction work shall not be less than the minima set by the wage determination unit in the Department of Labor. Now that unit generally sets wage minima for the various crafts 10 to 15 percent higher than the average wage actually paid for those crafts in the areas in which it sets pay rates. And that means then that the people who were doing repair work on highways who were not previously covered by the act are now getting compensation 15 percent higher than they otherwise would receive. So much of the five billion dollars is going to higher pay for the already employed rather than into hiring additional highway repair workers. The highway bill then will add less than 100,000 jobs at the expense of 250,000 jobs in other industries. So there will be a net loss of 150,000 jobs as a consequence of that job creating highway bill. And turning to the protectionist measures being offered in Congress aimed at preserving the jobs of auto and steel workers. You know, there's a local content bill on automobiles now going through Congress which I think is about to be passed by the House of Representatives. Now, uh, those protectionist bills, too, will, if enacted, create, destroy more jobs than they preserve. Now, suppose these measures stop $10 billion worth of auto and steel imports from coming into the United States. Now, the annual compensation of auto and steel workers is a little over $40,000 a year. So that means stopping $10 billion of imports, then, will preserve 250,000 jobs. But foreigners will no longer be receiving $10 billion from sales in the United States. And so as a consequence, they'll have $10 billion less to spend purchasing goods from the United States. Now, since the average annual compensation of workers in our export industries is under $30,000 a year, annual compensation in the export industries exceeds annual compensation on the average in the United States, the $10 billion that will no longer be spent by foreigners for U.S. made goods will mean the destruction of 330,000 jobs in our export industries. So we will have saved 250,000 jobs in autos and steel at the price of 330,000 jobs in export industries. There will be a net loss of 80,000 jobs as a result of any bills enacted to save jobs in autos and steel. Now, there are strong political pressures to enact bills to save jobs in autos and steel and to enact measures to create jobs. The people who have become unemployed as a consequence of the exorbitant rates of pay in the auto and steel industries and their resultant job losses to imported products are highly visible and they are a cohesive political group. They press for the enactment of protectionist measures. They frighten congressmen with the threat of a loss of votes in the next election if their congressmen don't enact such measures. Now, the people who will become unemployed in our export industries, if protectionist measures are enacted, are larger in number, but they don't know who they are. They do not then form the sort of cohesive political group that the United Auto Workers and the United Steel Workers are. The people who lost their jobs or have failed to find employment in companies that lost business because spending has been diverted from them to paying a higher gasoline tax also don't know who they are. At the time the bill was offered, they did not know who they would be. So they too did not form a cohesive political group in opposition to the gasoline tax. Now the contractors associations, the highway construction equipment companies, and the craft unions knew the benefits they could expect. So they acted together to press for such legislation as the highway bill. Now the net result of these sorts of pressures and lack of pressures is that our political system is producing governmental policies 
in the name of encouraging a return to prosperity and more employment, which do exactly the opposite. Now, prior to the 1930s, when we had greater freedom in choosing our jobs, our output per worker and our real wage rates rose more consistently and more rapidly than in any other country in the world, bringing us first to first place in productivity and real wage rates. But now we have dropped from a rate of rise that was in first place among major industrialized nations to a rate of rise which is now next to last place. Real hourly wage rates in the United States used to double every 30 years, at least up till 1972. But since then, real wage rates have declined by nearly 8%. Now that decline can be blamed largely on the many politically determined economic policies, policies that benefit a few at a heavy cost to the nation. The negative in our negative sum political game is becoming intolerable. Well, at this point, I think we'll open it up for questions, if you like.